Hey, BK, with Oprah Cohen. You know, Dumbo was like not a thing when I was a kid. It wasn't the kind of place you like walk around and you're like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing ever. My dad owns like the coolest neighborhood in the world. Right. You'd like walk around and be like, oh, there might be a dead body down there. On today's episode, I talked to Jed Valentis, the often thoughtful and always open real estate developer behind the revival of Brooklyn. In the late 90s, Jed transformed his father, David's, buildings on the downtown Brooklyn waterfront and created Dumbo, one of the most desirable neighborhoods in the city. He calls David by his first name and gives him most of the credit. David borrowed $12 million in the 1970s to buy 2 million square feet in Dumbo. Now in his 40s, Jed is married and his father of two young kids, one adopted from Haiti. How did that come about? It came about from my wife. Um, like most things, she gets more credit than I do. But she was adopted, you know, a different adoption process in Minnesota. Um, but it's very much part of her story. It was something she always wanted to do. Um, so yeah, she's uh, she's an incredible little girl. It's been a great experience. How old was she when she when you guys like, adopted her? Uh, she came home at two and a half, and uh, but the process took over three years. So we started the process actually before she was even born. <laughs> The international adoption world is uh, an awful, awful world. The public policy around it is just terrible. You know, millions of kids rotting in orphanages around the world. And the process is, is just insane. Jed, who grew up privileged in a much greater Manhattan than today, built up the family business Two Trees with his best friend, Amish Patel. Growing up in New York City, when did you realize your dad owns a neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's weird, you know, as a kid, you're always asking your parents what they do and like developer wasn't like, I didn't even, you don't even, I didn't even know what that meant, right? <laughs> it wasn't like one of the categories of things right. <laughs> uh, and people would be like, well, is he a builder? It's like, no, not really. We had no real sense of people's real wealth and I don't think it manifested itself in quite the way there was no you know there was no private jet like little brats running around and without the internet all your information came from your peer group we weren't going and doing like research on like our right. friends parents in like the fourth, fourth grade yeah. the city was different you know we'd get mugged every couple weeks you know not at gunpoint but like some kid was like i want your fucking watch and like Wah. Um, and maybe you'd get hit occasionally and, um, the city was very different. And then the other thing you got to understand, you know, Dumbo was like not a thing when I was a kid, you know, right. our, our offices were in Manhattan, all their other projects were in Manhattan. So I went to Dumbo a couple times a year, but there were years when David only went to Dumbo a couple times a year. I mean, there were a lot of dormant and there was nothing to do. And it wasn't the kind of place where you went and you were like... This is what, the 80s? This is the 80s, yeah. yeah. It wasn't the kind of place you like walk around and you were like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing ever. My dad owns like the coolest neighborhood in the world. Right. You'd like walk around and be like, oh, there might be a dead body down there. Right. Or like there's a like dead cat splayed in the street. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but I mean, I guess I kind of... None of us had any... I mean, he clearly had tremendous vision and foresight and, you know, the thing was amazing, but none of us knew or had any idea that it would become what it is today. I mean, forget about Dumbo being a mess. The city was a mess in the 80s. Right. Walk down the street as a fourth grader and would like cr collect crack files off the sidewalk. Like that was like a thing you'd do. People's relationship with neighborhoods and spaces and the, and the whole city from a real estate standpoint was totally different. Fast forward, Jed graduated from Penn and took a job working for a friend of a friend who later became president of the United States. I spent a year with Donald. Um, it's a little surreal, kind of now in hindsight. Um, it's it's definitely something to talk about over dinner. I mean, you know, I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> asking you about this. and Yes, a lot of people are asking about it. Um, I've certainly tried not to uh, get involved in politics in a, in a public spectrum. I will say that Donald was incredible to me. David was really pretty much retired or, or semi-retired and, and not really active in the business. The company was really small. So after college, you just kind of flow with what your buddies. So I had two job. I had two job offers <laughs> coming out of Penn. One was to go write sports for the New York Post, 
which was like kind of a dream thing. Like I kind of, you know, I joke, or my parents joke that I like learned how to read reading the sports section of the New York Post, which is probably a little true. Um, and the other was going to work for Donald. Um, and then when he hired me, you know, he's like, when are you done with school? Uh, whatever, June, whatever. And he goes, and when do you go back to school? And I go back to school. I'm like, I'm graduating. He's like, oh, I thought this was an internship. And I was like, no, I thought it was a real job. And he's like, well, it doesn't really matter. If you do a good job, you can stay. And if you do a shitty job, we're going to get rid of you anyway. So call it whatever you want. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's fair. <laughs> the other thing about that place, you know, <laughs> and you see it now a little bit at the White House, it might be a little less effective there. Um, it's tiny. It's tiny. You know, they didn't really, really own or develop that many assets. They had already figured out the licensing business. So a lot of the stuff that had his name on it, you know, there was no work to do per se. Um, but the fact that it was tiny made it a great place for a 21 year old, you know, having that experience as a, as a kid was, was really impactful. And, and I think gave me a lot of confidence to go and, and do a lot of the things and, and be able to make a lot of the decisions that we made. And, and again, you know, confidence is so important with that stuff. And, and so why was this experience uh, only a year? So David called the State Department of Labor had a lease for the entire clock tower building that they signed in the mid eighties. And the lease was up and they were leaving. And as I said, he was not fully retired, but kind of um, semi-retired. And there just wasn't, there was no, there were no projects in the office. And the only kind of real exit strategy was to convert the buildings to residential, which had always been the plan. And, and government was like, no, we're going to bring shipping back to these piers and we're going to protect manufacturing. And, you know, it made no fucking sense. And our, my first day, my first meeting, we went and met with Mitch Corby and Regina Meyer, who were running the Brooklyn City Planning Office. And we said, we want to rezone the neighborhood. And they were like, this is insane. <laughs> they were like, okay. So we basically cut a deal with them that we rezoned the build, the block that the clock tower was on and the adjacent block. We did it. They were like, you can, so we were, just do that building. Then we'll do the rest of it mixed use. They're like, no, no, no. One block is spot zoning. We were like, okay, two blocks. They were like, sure. <laughs> And then the and then we came back a year later and did the rest of the neighborhood. It started as a rental building and then it no, converted to condo or no 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 it was always condos. One we didn't have any money. I mean, like really, we didn't have any money. Nobody would finance the clock tower building. We brought twenty five bankers over there. We could get zero loans, and we ended up closing a loan with a group called Emmis. Okay, we basically built two hundred fifty thousand feet in six months. Amish and I were there seven days a week. We worked guys around the clock. I would, we, you know, I would go to the grocery store at night and like the tin knockers would be there and then like drink beer with them and like watch them like hang tin until like midnight. And then I'd go home and like come back in the morning. Um, it was nuts. And we had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea what we were doing. But it was really fun. And that's how you learn. But so this is a very long answer to your question. So why condos? A, we had no money. You know, we right. had... We had some assets and we had, but we had, from a liquidity standpoint, we had no money and, and we wanted to make a little money and have a little liquidity. In addition to that, the buildings were, were too big. You know, one main street was 105 or 110 feet wide by 200 feet long or something. You can't make a, so the average apartment size was, I don't know, 1500 feet. You, you can't make a rental yeah. apartment work. Um, Definitely not that. So bad. that was number two. And then number three, we had a long-term view of the neighborhood and we wanted to infuse it with home ownership and, and have people that would, you know, to some extent be our partners there. But we also recognized from their perspective, renters a little like hotel guests, there's no upside to them going to a neighborhood with no services. There's no, there's right. no value proposition if you're renting, right? right? It's just a fucking hassle. Right. <laughs> it might be cheaper, but there's no value proposition. Whereas if you're selling, you will get people with a pioneering spirit to come and buy in and know that they're going to take the ride with you and, and buy into the vision of the thing. And so, so those were the three factors in terms of, of why condos and not rentals. And really the first 10 years we were in business, basically all Amish and I did was, you know, monetize and execute on the real estate that David had aggregate, aggregated, you know, over the previous 20 years. 
right? And, and we basically spent our first eight to 10 years just in Dumbo, um, going from one building to the next. We did the clock tower, and then we did do two little rental projects because they were tiny and brick and timber. And then we did 70 Washington. And in the middle of that, we started the office program down there. It was the first dot-com kind of wave and and people were getting priced out of lower Manhattan and we recognized we had some like quasi real tenants in the in the buildings that were too big to convert. And then we bought 125 Court Street it was our first reasonably big acquisition in the Amish and I era outside of Dumbo. Jed and Tutoris have gone on to develop some of the most transformative projects along Brooklyn's waterfront. He's spearheading the redevelopment of the Domino Sugar Project in Williamsburg, anchored by Domino Park. Building the park was clearly as fun for Jed as it was for his seven-year-old Theo. It sounds like, you know, doing this kind of sort of thing is a big part of what you, who you are. I remember seeing you at the opening of Domino Park, right? In a way, I think you're much more proud when you give and when you do something for the greater good. Is that an accurate sort of... So yes, it's, you know, it's an incredible privilege to be able to give back and, uh, and do things for others, but, but it's not lost on me that, that our situation makes it much easier for me to do that than, you know, most random people, or at least in the way we do it, right? Do building Domino Park is, is something a lot of people would love to do, right? right. But, but we have an opportunity to do it. I work with a lot of people that have similar uh, <laughs> similar amounts of, you know, access. They're sure. not as thoughtful about communities. I work hard and I love it and, and I'm super proud of what we've done. Um, but David, my parents gave me, you know, huge opportunity. Um, and the real estate business is a long-term business, right? So, you know, and he started with absolutely nothing. He grew up basically an orphan up in Rochester. Um, so building it from zero to where he built it to is in a lot of ways a lot harder than what Amish and I have done, you know, over the last 22, right. 23 years. Uh, and we have an amazing organization, um, really amazing, you know, so I get all the credit and I'm in the newspaper and I come and do your thing with you and the thing. And But I mean, there are probably, you know, 15 or 20 people there that have been there for yeah. close to 15 years now. Uh, I mean, it's an incredible group. You know, I'm only in my 40s, but even, you know, our parents' generation. Um, New York's been an incredible, incredible, you know, place over the last 60, 75 years. Um, that's had real impact on the world and, and is really, you know, has been the center of the world. I'm not sure it'll continue to be forever. I mean, I'm sure it won't if you take a long enough time horizon. Um, but being a part of that and growing up here, um, having it be so much a part of me, I think is really influenced and informed a lot of that stuff but it's it's very different than than certainly any place else in the country but really the world and and i think it does make our relationship with the real estate different right and, and then ultimately everything's about people and and having the diversity of people that we have here and having the the drive and the energy it becomes a little much sometimes but i think you know, we do all thrive on that in terms of making places, you know, which are ultimately for people, you know, doing it in New York makes it a really special and different thing than I think developing in lots of other places would. Now seven-year-olds know what real estate developers Seven-year-olds? Yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit, a little bit. He's super, he's super proud of the park. We talk about the park all the time. And uh, he spent a bunch of time there. The buildings, I think he has less, uh, and maybe he gets it from me because I get a little less excited about the buildings. You know, most of the questions from him are are park related or BQX related. Uh, how's the train doing, Daddy? Very slow, buds. Very <laughs> slow. Looking ahead, Jed is a leading advocate of the BQX, a new streetcar system to link Brooklyn and Queens. Was that his idea? <laughs> Was it Theo's idea? <laughs> How did it come No, about? it was uh, from from my world. It was really Michael Kimmelman's idea. Mm -hmm. I was on an airplane, so I found a Michael Kimmelman column on building a modern streetcar up and down the Brooklyn Queens waterfront, and I was like, "Wow, what a great idea!" <laughs> and then, probably a little bit out of 
arrogance and a little bit out of like a lack of trust in government i for whatever reason concluded that this idea was not going to happen without somebody really pushing the idea but the genius of the bqx is not serving 60 or 70 thousand people along this corridor okay it's it's building a proof test for a model where New York City can start to build its own infrastructure without having Albany tell it no and without having Washington tell it no. And then you can go replicate that model both with other streetcars around the city, but you can also start to replicate the model in terms of the relationship between public goods and real estate. And I know a lot of people have gentrification anxieties, but the real long-term solution to gentrification is not stunting growth right it's creating real equitable equitable access to real public goods in all parts of our city so there's not the tremendous imbalance between the haves and the have-nots go build 15 bqx's go provide real equitable transit real equitable education to folks all over the city okay and then the gap right starts to narrow a little when you can bring the bottom up a little People more and more and more like to live and work in similar communities, okay? And it's really good for our city, right? The hub and spoke model of living out in Brooklyn and Queens and like commuting into Manhattan and that's where your job has to be is an archaic thing that doesn't need to happen anymore. Though civically minded, Jed has ruled out entering politics and he's coming to terms with being something of a public figure. It's a little weird. It's a little strange. I had a complete stranger recognize me in Domino Park like a month ago oh, wow. bearded me the fuck out <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> you know my little boy we have a bunch of like close friends some of whom have kids that are older than us and it's you know i had an experience a year ago where and i don't know exactly what they went and did but they all went and got on a computer or a phone or something and theo came back and he's like daddy you're like famous i don't know exactly what word he used but they like googled <laughs> me or us or something so he's not you know, he's not reading well enough to like go traipsing through Google quite yet, but, but they will. And there's all kinds of stuff out there and some of it's flattering and a little of it's not flattering and lots of it's inaccurate. Um, and then there's lots of it. You just don't want a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old to know. And as a parent, you know, Raising children with this level of privilege and wealth is maybe the only thing that gives me real anxiety in life. You know, you take tremendous joy in like giving them things and making their lives easier. Um, and at the same time, you know that giving them too much is a disaster and will really really fuck them up and, and finding that balance between you know letting them enjoy some of the success right. that you've had and, and and figuring out where that stuff is okay and where you're like not doing them any favors is really hard if you listen to this show before i usually try to ask tell us uh tell me something nobody knows about jed Valentis. Nobody knows. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> the public. I caught Boris Becker's tennis racket after he won the 1989 U.S. Open. Oh wow! Chucked it in the crowd. That's I still cool. have it. Uh, that was a funny That's thing. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm pretty lucky with stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know what else uh, people don't know. I feel like generally pretty open That's and candid. Right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jed Walentis. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Sofa. You're listening to Hey BK, the podcast about the people behind Brooklyn's transformation. You can find us at heybk.nyc or wherever you get your podcast. I'm Ofer Cohen. Thanks for listening.